In the last video, we looked at the allyl radical and found from analysis of electron spin resonance spectroscopy that unpaired spin density can be positive or negative in an open shell molecule and that doubly filled orbitals are polarized so that alpha and beta electrons don't necessarily occupy the same regions of space even for what we think of as formally doubly occupied orbitals. So now we're going to look at the implications for doing calculations in open shell systems. So this is just to remind you of the situation where the doubly occupied pi 1 orbital is polarized by the singly occupied orbital and moreover each of those orbitals then polarizes uh, sigma orbitals for CH bonds and there's just polarization throughout the molecule. <clears throat> so let's examine what are we going to do in order to uh, model these open shell systems. So there's two approaches one might take. There is something called the restricted open shell model. It can also be applied in density functional theory, which we haven't quite gotten to yet, but uh, in the context of Hartree-Fock theory, it's ROHF, restricted open shell Hartree-Fock. It is physically incorrect in that it prevents the spin polarization. It enforces double occupation of every orbital except those orbitals having only one electron. It's technically cumbersome, it turns out, to implement, and we don't need to dwell on that. And it can lead to something called symmetry breaking, which is an artifact of having imposed this double occupation. And again, that's sort of technical, we don't need to worry about it. I'm not really going to focus much on it except to say that uh, usually I would choose not to do it because it's physically unrealistic. The other alternative is to do something, uh, once upon a time it was called different orbitals for different spins, DODS, but more commonly you'll hear it referred to as unrestricted Hartree-Fock or density functional theory when we get to it. So uh, abbreviated with a U, so UHF would be unrestricted Hartree-Fock, meaning that you do not attempt to restrict alpha and beta orbitals, even in formally doubly occupied orbitals, to occupy uh, the same space, to have the same shapes. So you can model spin polarization. I'm not sure why it's called Zazian here, but spin polarization. It's actually quite easy to implement. You basically do two separate SCFs in a way. You do the alpha electrons and you do the beta electrons, and you solve for the orbitals of each. Of course, they do feel each other through electron repulsion, and there's a different exchange because there's different spins, but it's just a question of having a Fock operator for the alpha electrons and a Fock operator for the beta electrons. <clears throat> it gives a lower energy than the ROHF uh, method does, which, as we know from the variational principle, that's associated with a better wave function. However, there is no such thing as a free lunch. It turns out that unrestricted wave functions can show something called spin contamination. So what's that? Well, remember that spin is a property, a molecular property. And you can compute expectation values from spin operators that have good quantum numbers that tell you something about the number of unpaired electrons. So there's the total spin operator, S squared, and there's the spin along the Z component uh, operator SZ. And again, it looks like little hats seem to be translating all over the page. But uh, these are operator symbols, so they go over these operators. So if I evaluate for a given psi the expectation value of S squared, and this is just another way notationally to write this, a little more shorthand, or I can uh, do the same thing with S sub Z, the correct values for S squared are S times S plus 1, where S is the sum of the spins of the open shell electrons. So for a doublet, which is really what we've been considering so far, that's one unpaired spin, it's 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 plus 1 is 1.5. So half of 1.5 is 0 0.75, because S is a half. So S squared 0.75, S sub Z equals a half, or, or uh, yes, equals a half. Okay. Uh, it is 2 for triplets because s equals 1, so you get 1 times 2 is 2, and you can just keep computing as you have more and more unpaired electrons. Okay, and for restricted open shell wave functions, the ones I told you I didn't really like, it turns out that they always have the correct values. They are eigenfunctions of the total spin operator and the s sub z operator. Unrestricted open shell wave functions, unfortunately, 
always show values higher than these values. They are not eigenfunctions. They are contaminated with higher spin states. <clears throat> Why? Well, let's think about how the calculation works and it will become more apparent why there is this component of higher spin states in a UHF wave function. So let's take our friend the owl radical, just keeps coming back. If I did an ROHF calculation, I would have pi 1, the all bonding orbital, pi 2, the non bonding orbital, and pi 3, and it's well described as two electrons in pi 1, no change of shape here, an electron in pi 2, and uh, nothing in pi 3. All right, so if I were to write this as an anti-symmetrized determinant, it'd be pi 1 alpha, pi 1 beta, pi 2 alpha. And that's that. That's the ROHF wave function. I'm only showing the pi part here. Of course, there's a whole bunch of sigma orbitals too, but really we'll see it in the pi system and it'll be notationally more convenient to only look at that part. Now, we've already discussed how in the UHF system, there is polarization of the alpha pi 1 orbital and the beta pi 1 orbital. And so I'll indicate those for notational convenience. I'll call it pi 1a and pi 1b. Well, how do I make this orbital, actually? The way that I could make it is, if I take this pi 1 over here, because I want to compare my ROHF to my UHF. If I take pi 1 and I subtract a little bit of pi 3, well then this minus this, that'll make the amplitude here a little smaller, because they've got the same phase. And this minus this, their opposite phase, so that'll actually increase the amplitude out here. So pi 1a is like subtracting a little bit of pi 3 from pi 1. And by exact analogy, uh, pi 1b is constructed by adding a little bit of pi 3 to pi 1. So that's pretty easy. So if I now go and write this wave function, the anti-symmetrized pi 1a for the alpha spin, pi 1b for the beta spin, pi 2 for the alpha spin, it's, it looks just the same in both ROHF and UHF. Well, let me replace what pi 1a and pi 1b are here with the sums and differences of uh, pi 3. So here is, I'm going to move the, the beta out front here, pi 1 plus lambda pi 3 times, and here's the pi 1a alpha, pi 1 minus lambda pi 3, and here's the pi 2. So let me keep expanding that. I see that I have a pi 1 alpha times pi 1 beta times pi 2 alpha, and that looks just like the ROHF piece. Okay, so I've already got the ROHF in there. But I've also got a term in lambda times lambda, and there's a negative sign, so minus lambda squared, pi 3 alpha, pi 3 beta, pi 2 alpha. Well, look what that looks like. That looks like a double excitation. I don't have anything in pi 1, but I've got an alpha and a beta up here in pi 3. So that's like a double excitation of the ROHF wave function. It's multiplied times lambda squared, so it's a CI wave function, right? It's a sum of, de it's a linear combination of determinants that includes some excited state determinants. So it's like I did a little CI, so of course the energy went down. I've improved my wave function through configuration interaction. So I get some dynamical correlation out of that. But then there's this term. So there's a lambda pi 3 pi 1 pi 2. There's a lambda pi 3 pi 1 pi 2. And I've just shown them here. I've collected them in order of lambda. And now for the bad news. This beta electron in 1, alpha electron in 2, alpha electron in 3, that is not a pure spin state. Uh, that could be a doublet or it could be a quartet. And in fact, I've got a linear combination of the two when I write it out this way. And I won't go through all the spin algebra, I'll just ask you to trust me that uh, if you did it properly, you would need to add or subtract some other configurations in order to get a proper spin state. The bigger lambda is, the larger the spin contamination associated with the quartet state that's hiding in here. So that spin contamination, as, as Thomas puts it here, can be quite a nuisance in highly delocalized systems where there's a lot of polarization. And so here's just a quick example. Consider a polyenal radical. So this is a molecule that is uh, a polymer of 
of single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, right? It's a polyene. And as a function of n, that's the polymer length, I guess, if you look at the s squared value, it's always a radical, right? It ought to be 0.75. But in fact, as you add more and more uh, carbon atoms, it starts increasing from a beginning allyl radical of about 1 up to, uh, by the time you're up to 10 carbons, you've got an S squared in excess of 2, and it just goes catastrophic. When you're up at 40 carbons, you've got an S squared approaching 8. Remember, it's a, it's a radical, it's a doublet. It should have an S squared of 0 0.75. So you're horribly contaminated with other spin states. So if we just zoom in on a single one of these, and we ask about the bond length alternation. So if it weren't a radical, if it were just a polyene, you would expect the double bonds to be about 1.34 angstroms, the single bonds to be about 1.54 angstroms, and the alternation of one bond to the next would be about two tenths of an angstrom, right? That would be a perfectly alternating system. In the radical, when I abstract a, a hydrogen atom from one end, if I do a ROHF calculation, I do see, and this is just looking at from one bond to the next along this chain, what's the alternation? With the restricted open shell model, which is a true doublet, what I see is there's a lot of alternation out at the ends, and then in the very middle, it drops to zero. So it's kind of like there's an allyl radical hiding here in between two long uh, chain polyenes. So all the radical density is located here. If I do an unrestricted calculation, that's what is going on over here, where the S squared is going up, 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 up. I find this kind of bizarre situation where there's a little bit of alternation right out at the edges, but otherwise every carbon-carbon bond length is exactly the same. And so it's an extremely delocalized uh, radical. Now, this actually has physical consequences. The, the polyene I'm describing is called polyacetylene, and physicists know, uh, actually chemists do too, I shouldn't give the physicists too much credit, what the delocalization length roughly is in polyacetylene, that's called a soliton, and really the correct curve ought to look like these blue dashed lines. Well, there's only one, the blue dashed line. And so you see that both UHF and ROHF are quite unsatisfying. You might say ROHF looks a little bit more realistic in a sense, but they, they both have massive errors. And so uh, the error in UHF comes from the spin contamination that's associated with overestimating spin polarization. So that contamination in the Hartree-Fock wave function means that when you go and do post-Hartree-Fock calculations, maybe MP2, maybe coupled cluster theory, you may suffer even worse problems as the poor reference leads to perturbation theory, for instance, MP2, doing really goofy things. Uh, so here's a case of absurd results. Let's just look at the benzyl radical. So here's a, a system that every organic chemist ought to know and love. You've taken a hydrogen atom off toluene, and you have the benzyl radical. And you can ask, what's the rotational barrier to rotate the methylene about the C-ipso, C-benzyl bond? And you can measure that. You can do an NMR experiment if you'd like and uh, look at the... Uh, I guess you'd probably have to label it in some way, but trust me, you can measure it. And the correct answer is that it has a barrier to rotation of about 11 kcals per mole. <clears throat> so if you go and you do a ROHF calculation, you discover that it uh, is happiest when it's planar, that's no surprise, and it costs you about 5 kcals per mole to rotate. So that's not terribly satisfying. You're off by half the barrier height or a little more. If you do a UHF calculation, it says it'll cost you 20 kcals per mole to rotate. So that's not particularly satisfying either. You're overestimating the barrier. Now, if you decide that you're going to add dynamical electron correlation by uh, putting in MP2 corrections on the, on the UHF wave function, so it's an unrestricted MP2 calculation, things start off looking pretty good. It's going up, 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 it's starting to flatten out, it looks like it's going to get within, you know, a couple kcals of the right answer. And you're at about 70 degrees here, and then you rotate one more degree, and, uh-oh, the energy drops enormously, and you get 
an orthogonal structure, right? This is the methylene rotated, so the two hydrogen atoms are above and below the plane of the aromatic ring, and it's predicted to be lower in energy than the planar form. So that's, that's just so wrong in so many ways. And so what's going on there? Well, if you look at the structures, and you look at the spin populations, then at the 70 degree length, it still looks a little bit like what you'd expect for a benzyl radical. It's got a lot of alpha spin, 1.34, at the benzylic position, and it delocalizes a fair amount of spin at the ortho and the para positions. But there's a lot of polarization. There's actually a big negative spin density at the ipsocarbon and a big negative spin density at the metacarbon. And then I go just a degree further and while there's not a huge change in the bond lengths, there's a massive change in the spin distribution. So suddenly, almost all the spin is localized on the benzylic position, and there's a little negative spin density, ipso, ortho, and para, and now there's a little positive spin density, meta. And so in essence, I've, I've, it's almost like I've changed electronic states. This used to look like a benzylic radical, now this looks like a very localized radical. And so if I plot, now I'm going to refer over to this axis, if I look at S squared as I'm following this rotation, so this now for the UHF wave function that the MP2 correction is being done to, it starts off very high, very spin contaminated at about 1.3, and it starts to drop, 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 it's doing a little better, and right here where it makes this big change, this localized radical has very little spin contamination. It's, it's very close to 0.75 because it's not a terribly polarizable system anymore. There's not a big pi system that the radical can interact with. And so it's just, you know, this is nonsense and it's something that arises because of, uh, because of spin polarization and spin contamination at unrestricted Hartree-Fock levels. Turns out if you actually start rotating backwards from the uh, Hartree-Fock system, you, you It'll stick on this kind of funny localized radical surface for a while. I mean, these are just pathological behaviors. Now, the good news is, uh, if your radical is really quite well localized, so not something with an aromatic system, but maybe it's an alkyl or an oxo or an amino or, or what have you, you often see much less severe problems than these worst-case scenarios. Nevertheless, you should always be watchful, and any time you do an unrestricted calculation, you must, you simply must, look at the expectation value of S squared. And if it's not reasonably close to the eigenvalues that you expect for your number of unpaired electrons, then you need to think about it. Uh, what are you going to do in order to uh, do a different calculation that will give you more trustworthy results? All right, that is the end of the discussion of open shell systems. There's going to be one more video in this series, and we're going to look at properties other than the energy which can be derived from wave function-based calculations. See you then.